Yeah, that's working. So after the last two years, uh, we have been supported by Bushfire Natural Hazard Cooperative Research Centre and been working with a number of state government departments, including SafeCom and Juna, with people such as Ed Pacusa, uh, Mike Walters, um, James Guy, to develop a modelling platform to assess our natural hazard risk moving into the future over about a 30-year time planning horizon. Um, in addition, we've been forming a number of future scenarios in order to test different mitigation options out over the future. And so today what I'm doing is I'm going to present the modelling platform which we've developed and, in, and introduce those scenarios as well. So our involvement in natural hazard and in particular natural hazard mitigation began in 2013. At this stage, the Australian Business Roundtable for Disaster Risk Reduction released a report which showed that our natural hazard uh, risk was growing into the future disproportionately as well. And so with many others in Australia, we were particularly concerned about this trend. At the same time, um, we knew of several studies which showed that for every dollar we invest in mitigation today, we can reduce the present value of our response and recovery by about $4. So there was a lot of evidence showing the value in mitigation. And yet when we looked at uh, Commonwealth spending on mitigation, it was only 3% of their total spend in natural hazard management, which seemed to be suboptimal to us. Little has changed today. And so this quote from Helen Clark at last year's United Nations Sendai um, Forum really uh, captures our thoughts at this time, that it's better to... Um, sorry. That it's better to build a fence at the top of a cliff than to park an ambulance at the bottom. And that's where we entered this story. Uh, we had a wealth of experience here at University of Adelaide and our partners, Research Centre for Information and Knowledge Systems in the Netherlands, um, in environmental modelling, in the use of optimisation and in decision science. And we thought, couldn't we use this experience to build some models in order to explore how our risk will evolve into the future? We know risk will increase, but we, in terms of informing policy, and uh, investment in mitigation, really need to know where risk occurs and um, what natural hazards will cause the most risk into the future so we can carefully spend our mitigation dollars in options which are most effective. And so the rest of my presentation, first I will, um, first I will show you the software. Uh, then I will go into a little bit more detail into the modelling behind the software as well as show the scenarios that we have developed to explore the future. And finally I'll wrap up with um, some exploration of other applications of the modelling type systems we're using for this project in other areas of natural resource management. So as I stated, what we've developed is a decision support system for assessing policy and planning investment options for optimal natural hazard mitigation. This is what our software looks like, which we've developed. It runs on a personal desktop computer, a Windows computer. Uh, it, it's a fairly typical piece of software in that it has a menu system, a toolbar, but most of the work done within this software happens within this main window. It's designed for practitioners, not necessarily for scientists, and so it has a emphasis on testing different policy measures rather than on the model parameters. Uh, although for um, the scientists and those who understand the models well, you can go into more detail and change parameters of the models as well. Uh, it's in the main window, we have a guided workflow in the use of this software. Uh, from the forming of scenarios, the selection of external drives which will change risk into the future, such as the choice of climate projections, or population projections into the future. Uh, the selection of different policy drivers, that is your mitigation options, which will reduce your risk into the future, so we can test the effect of these. Um, once you've done all that, you can save them as a scenario and run the model, and the model will then uh, produce maps of different indicators, including such things as the average annual loss from your building stock, uh, where your fatalities and casualties will occur on the map, um, as well as social and environmental indicators as well. 
It might initially be a bit of a surprise to include social and environmental indicators, but as we know from places such as Brown Hill Creek, where there's been a lot of um, uh, tension regarding the damming of Brown Hill Creek, a lot of our mitigation options do have social and environmental consequences, so it's important also to assess the impact of our mitigation options on these criteria as well. In addition, we have post-modelling analysis, which allows us to estimate benefit-cost ratios of various different mitigation options. Um, just a few more screenshots of our software. As I said, um, you can visualise um, where risk will occur. So this is a map of bushfire risk. Um, and we produce risk maps for each year into the future and actually you can watch it as the model simulates how the risk will evolve, which is kind of neat. Um, this is just a screenshot of the interface for selection of mitigation options which we want, might want to test for reducing bushfire risk. Uh, so it's showing um, an interface where you can select uh, different parameters going into the effectiveness of education programs to reduce arson as well as investment options to reduce, uh, to increase our community resilience and you can select or, or um, put in different planned burning regimes there as well and test the effectiveness of that. So the second part of my talk I want to go into a little bit more detail into how we actually model risk. So, so as I previously mentioned our modelling is based on three key aspects. Uh, the intensity of hazard and where that hazard occurs, what is exposed to that hazard as well as the vulnerability of that which is exposed. And so we have modelling components to, to estimate all three of these components. Uh, I'm going to focus mainly on bushfire today, but we also have models within our system for assessing uh, coastal surge, riverine flooding, uh, heat wave and earthquake as well as bushfire. In terms of bushfire, we estimate hazard um, using what could be considered a many-factor empirical model. It, for those who are familiar with the TASBRAM model, it's very similar in concept to that. It subdivides or splits hazard, bushfire hazard, into three main components, ignition potential, suppression cap capability, and fire behaviour. In turn, each of these components are estimated using a multifactorial empirical relationship, taking into account um, aspects such as the proximity to road networks for ignition potential, for we know that a lot of the bushfires we have in the Mount Lofty ranges are from arson, and so therefore the accessibility through the road network is important for that. Uh, and so in the interface you can see all these different input layers which um, build up to form our bushfire risk, including vegetation type, time since last fire, and layers showing our suppression capability, which takes into account, again, factors such as proximity to road as well as CFS stations. In terms of exposure, um, we work out what building stock is exposed and what population density will be exposed to fire using a combination of building stock and land use models. Uh, there is much evidence that the main driver of future risk is land use. As you could imagine, the growth of population density within the Mount Lofty ranges could be expected to significantly increase our bushfire risk into the future. Likewise, loss of permeability in our urban catchments will drive flooding risk into the future. So it's important to include land use modelling within the mix. Our land use model projects um, patterns of urban and rural development based on a number of factors, including um, the suitability of land for different land uses, accessibility to road networks, uh, spatial planning regulations, and these are all um, these are all used to calculate a transition potential, which essentially states uh, it's a proxy for the value of a certain land use type in a location, and then the land use model uses that to assign land uses for each location at each time uh, on a yearly time step across the simulation. What this allows us to do when we come to calculating vulnerability is it allows us to, um, oh, thank you, it allows us to calculate 
the number of buildings in each location the, um, within the Greater Adelaide region, as well as allows us to calculate population density based on apples and land use model, our data from the Nexus database, as well as building renewal rates. So that's the modelling side of our work. But as I said, this model is designed to look at natural hazard risk and, and how it will change into the future. Now the future is very uncertain. It will depend on a lot of um, what we observe in terms of risk into the future. It will depend on a number of factors, including some things which we can sort of model well, such as you know, ageing populations, but also a number of factors that we can't really model. What will be the policy decisions regarding um, urban density? Will we go for a, in the future, will we have a very spread out um, residential density or will we have a lot of indwelling? In so you could, you could imagine that there's a lot of multiple future pathways which we need to assess our mitigation options into the future. And so we've been developing future scenarios with our end users, um, been using questionnaires, interviews, and we conducted two workshops to develop uh, five scenarios um, each of these is a storyline into the future, which takes a broad account of um, different future pathways um, into the future. The idea is that if we have multiple future scenarios, we can model our mitigation options across these scenarios in order to work out which mitigation options are resilient towards different multiple future pathways and which ones are robust. In the final minute of my presentation, I just want to explore other areas where our modelling can be applied for natural hazard. No, sorry, other areas where our modelling can be applied for uh, planning. Um, because we integrate a number of land use models, which shows us, and transport models, we can really understand where populations will move or explore where populations will move into the future, which has a lot of relevance for things such as water resource and water quality planning. Uh, we can understand a lot of the policy, or explore a lot of the policy areas around the transportation and land use nexus, as well as uh, apply our model to understand the effects of a large number of different agricultural policies, as well as biodiversity management and house affordability. Um, in closing, natural hazard Management is complex and what we're building is a model to help us understand a number of the factors which lead into this complexity into the future in order to help inform policy, especially with regard to how we invest into mitigation. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I use words interchangeably at times. I tend to use wildfire and bushfire synonymous, although, as you say, it's not just bushfires that start from lightning. A lot of our fires in, in Mount Lofty Ranges is actually either accidental or arson attacks. So, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.